Hello and welcome to The Outdoor Given, episode 18. Interview with Peter Jones, the creator of the PDS-1. So back at the beginning of these podcasts, I talked about the DSC-1 and DSC-2, the DS Stalking Certificate Scheme, level 1 and level 2. Now, they were created back in the day by the British Deer Society. The actual DSC-1 was first recorded and created in 1997, but the first candidate to actually pass it was in 1998. So 26 years ago, we have used this standard for giving recognition for people to say that they are trained hunters. Whether you've got your level one or you've taken to the next standard, next level, which is level two. So Peter Jones has created the PDS-1, which is it's very similar course content to the DSC-1 and the DSC-2. But he has gone down a different route for accreditation. So it's actually a Lantra approved course, which is now starting to be recognized by, for example, the Forestry Commission in certain places. And it's slightly different spin on on how to present it. It's more done via the e-learning platforms. But anyway, uh, enjoy the podcast. And if there's any feedback or anything like that at the end of it, please feel free to either message it through or, or leave a comment. Thanks very much. Hello and welcome to the Outdoor Gibbon podcast. Today we are joined by Peter Jones. He is the founder of the Capriolus Club, County Deer Stalking and the Shooting and Hunting Academy. Hello, Peter. Morning, Peter. It's uh, it's it's good to be on. Nice to be speaking with you. Fantastic. Thank you very much. So before, well, we'll we'll get started, basically. And my first question to any guest that comes on the podcast is how did you get involved in shooting sports? kicking straight off with the big one there peter aren't you so, pretty much well it, uh, it's the it's the one that everybody wants to know is how you got kind of involved in in any of it really yeah yeah do you know it's um it's probably relatively underwhelming and very typical i imagine of you know most of your guys that get into deer stalking get into shooting sports i grew up in the countryside down towards uh, a well-known deer area called uh, Ashdown Forest, which is down towards East Sussex and Kent borders, that's that direction, and uh, overwhelming numbers of fallow deer down there. And I grew up on a on a farm. We weren't farming it, but we were essentially sort of surrounded by farmland. And, um, you know, like a lot of uh, kids that grow up in the countryside, how, how do you occupy your time? And uh, I think, you know, when my parents eventually bought me an air rifle, um <laughs> i don't think they saw me out of camouflage for the first summer you know so i was a uh, in and out of the woods for for long hours just uh you know hunting rabbits and pigeons and that type of thing and then it kind of evolved from there peter really i um after i finished my degree i joined the police so i was in the metropolitan police for 10 years and um really i suppose specialized uh, my speciality was firearms legislation uh, okay active there for for 10 years so i whilst i was doing that i kind of maintained my love of field sports and did it as a hobby whilst i was a police officer and then um when i left the police which was goodness me that was a while ago now i'd like to think it's quite recent but it was back in 2007 believe it or not right really wow so, okay. yeah so we're talking about 15 years ago i thought well you know let, let, let's set this field sports my love of field sports i'll set it up full time and it was then really that i started setting up um county deer stalking was the first one to, to set up okay so what what and, what does um, county deer stalking what, what's that ex- explain what that's about <laughs> Well, well, initially, I, I set up County Deer Stalking to go along as a sort of a sideline to, to other work. And um, it, it quickly became apparent that uh, that it was going to become a full time job for me. And, and all I was doing essentially is I set up a website and was starting to offer um, outings deer stalking. And okay. I think perhaps because of my proximity to London, I found that I was getting a lot of uh, 
a lot of appetite actually from you know city workers city residents those sort of guys and girls that couldn't necessarily access deer stalking in the same way as people who live in the country so it did afford them that that link to something that they they love to be able to do but you know couldn't otherwise access so um i i found that i got busier and busier uh, uh, pretty quickly oh fantastic yeah because it's one of those things i think everybody wants to do deer stalking but it's always the thing especially especially down south it's the it's having access to the land and knowing who to talk to and things like that so yeah obviously uh, it, it was a niche market at that point for you so it must have worked well well, you know, it, it, it's easy, isn't it? If you live in the country, you can, you know, you're going to meet farmers in the local pub or be able to knock on your neighbour's door and something like that. And and usually a lease or, or something will eventually transpire. But, you know, what I quickly realised is there's an awful lot of people, a lot of guys and girls in the city uh, who live in the city, got their jobs and their families and their lives in busy city centres who, you know, who can't access it, but nonetheless, they love their field sports. And and, and I think, you know, as country people, we, we have a, a duty, I think, to reach out to people in the towns and cities um, to be able to offer them that um, ability to be able to go and pursue something that we enjoy. It shouldn't just be the preserve of country people to be able to do cut field sports, should it? No, absolutely. And I suppose, I suppose being down in, in Sussex and things like that, you are literally a stone's throw away so it's it's no it's not it's not difficult for uh, somebody just to jump on the train even and and ride out you did because the train links down there are pretty good it's a bit different for me up in Aberdeenshire inviting somebody from London yeah. it's a bit of a mission to come up here for a for a weekend kind of uh, deer stalking yeah you're, you're you're quite right and um you know my first ground was just uh, straight down the M3 down into Hampshire and uh, I sometimes found that perhaps you know in, in the summer for road buck season a guy might finish his work in the evening and still be on the train and or on, on the motorway down to Hampshire and uh, still be able to put a few hours in deer stalking after work so it, it does it does it's, it's remarkably accessible if you yes. can get hold of that and and I think that often comes as a surprise to people who think that perhaps they're going to have to travel to Scotland to access good quality deer stalking when in actual fact the sheer quantity and, and diversity of deer species that you get you know, even in the home counties is is extraordinary. And, um, and and I think as well for a lot of guys that have perhaps come from Europe or the continent or Scandinavia or wherever it was, who have perhaps got jobs with the big banks in 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 the city, are uh, have it in their blood, you know, hunting and shooting yes. is in their yeah. blood. And so they really latched onto this and thought, well, this is fabulous because I can work for my big bank or, or or my big insurance company or my lawyer firm of lawyers or whatever it is and still be able to access the the field sports that I grew up with and so it's um you know it's a wonderful thing and and, and I, I'm ranting again on my soapbox here a little bit but I think Peter it's what what's wonderful as well and is is that you know we've got the ability as well to be able to get that message of you know of, of what we do out to city workers because that's uh, and sorry city residents because that's a really important message to get across as well i think when we spoke on the phone it was the the disconnect with with the city folk and the countryside folk has become well it's actually become huge it's, it's massive as you say you get your your scandinavians and your europeans that it's ingrained it's it's still part of the culture but i think for the for the uk it's it's kind of been so diluted we don't have that same connection anymore well i, I think you're absolutely right and i think it would be to our detriment if we thought of the process as a sort of an us and them type idea you know city people are against field sports and country people love them because i'm afraid to say that the demographics and the populations of both we're on a losing wicket aren't we if we, if we if we adopt that sort of attitude we are completely but again it goes just as much that people in the countryside are, are completely disconnected from field sports mm, yeah well I, it, it can be the case peter for sure so obviously that 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 brings up that's your first that was the county deer stalking what was your your next sort of uh part of that was it the capriolas club yeah well you know what's been really good I suppose and really uh, rewarding is the fact that as a business things have really sort of 
grown very organically. You know, some businesses you have to work very hard at and you'd really have to, um, you know, uh, plug away at in order to um, get the, to be able to market yourself, to be able to get the business. But I found that things evolved very organically and very naturally because clients that were coming to me to go deer stalking in the home counties and locally, I found were asking me more and more for advice on where they should go in the highlands or how could they access a different species or what if they want to do chamois or what if they want to do driven boar or they may say to me well look you know i've got this problem with my firearms license and i need some help with that and and uh, of course with the police background as well there i had a good understanding of firearms licensing and that type of thing as well so i found that i was giving away more and more advice to these guys who needed more and more of a kind of uh, a, a sort of a, a, a more of a high touch service and more of a sort of a, a a better service and so I was I was I was very pleased to be able to then set up Capriotas Club as a kind of the official members club of county deer stalking and okay. through that we could then take those people that were interested in you know facilitating access to those types of trips and events and and advice and support and involve them in a club and and peter and the other reason i think for it is that you you and i will know that deer stalking unlike perhaps you know some wing shooting and other field sports is actually quite a solitary pursuit it is yeah and and, and what was an absolute delight was be able to introduce these guys to one another and and develop a sort of camaraderie and a kind of a social group from what is otherwise a very insular, very, um, you know, very, very sort of unsociable pastime. Do you think that's just a, a UK based unsociable? Because obviously Scandinavia, it's all driven game and and, and it's kind of taken on the same way as as a day on the on, on bird shooting. So they all meet up in the morning. They'll all have a chat, have, have breakfast before they go out to their stands. And it is that seems to be a very sociable way of doing it, whereas obviously, as you say, the deer stalking community for the UK, it is you you get your rifle, you go out, potentially you take your dog with you, but you go for hours just searching for your your target species. Well, well it might it might be personality types. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, so some people don't want to mix with lots of other other people, do they? And, and that may be the reason why they choose, you know, uh, deer stalking as as their chosen field sport. So I, I'm very aware of that. And uh, and that may be the case with some people, but I think you're undoubtedly right. I think the uh, very nature of deer stalking in the UK tends to uh, require that that person, it does it in, in a solitary way, rather than, as you say, on the continent, whereby it's a much more sociable pastime. No, I, I I find it. I think it's always more fun when you actually got somebody out with you because there's that sort of you get to have that bit of connection with them. And especially if you're taking somebody out stalking, it's always the the look on their face when when you may have taken a beast or an animal at the end of it. And it's it's the sheer pleasure and actually re- getting some feedback off them always makes the day so much better. Doesn't it just? Yeah. Yeah. No, it is an absolute. It, it's a it's an absolute. I've got to say it's an absolute pleasure and a privilege to be able to take people out and to, you know, show them a little bit of, you know, what I love on the countryside and, you know, and our profound love for the species that we hunt. And yeah. that's I think, is a, an important point to get across. This is not about um, just killing. This is about engaging with the countryside and engaging with 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 a species which is so you know in many people's minds so kind of noble as a quarry i suppose yeah no i I always like to sort of say that the actual pulling of the trigger is is a very is a very clinical moment there's nothing anybody can do that realistically anybody can pull the trigger and and your animal will fall down it's the lead up to it and the work you have to do afterwards that's that's the bit that requires the most sort of skill knowledge and an understanding and sympathy to the actual environment that you're in you're you're quite right and you know there's no doubt that you know if your interest in deer stalking is just the ability to kill and pull the trigger then you're in for a disappointment aren't you because Absolutely. you and i know you don't always go out and get something and that actually represents just uh 
a few seconds of the actual outing. And, um, you know, that, that's not enough. It's got to be the, the, the love of the countryside, the love of the species. And, uh, and that's undoubtedly the, you know, got to be the driving feature. But Peter, I think actually, you know, what pops into my mind on that <clears throat> is um, another trend which we're seeing and, and have seen, I suppose, over the last few years. And that has been increasingly um, people picking up the phone and saying, look, I want to, I'm getting a bit, I suppose I'm turning away or I'm aware of the environmental pressures of intensively farmed meat. Um, and the green agenda is something that increasingly appeals. And so what I find is that increasingly people are picking up the phone and saying, look, I'm very interested in sourcing my own wild sustainable meat. Yeah. Yeah. And and that has, has surprised me uh, quite how fast uh, that trend has has grown. And I say a trend. I hope it's a it, it's not a a passing fad. I don't think it is. I think it is very much the mindset. And that whole sustainable agenda um, of uh, uh, and that green agenda and that um, you know agenda which moves towards sort of biodiversity and sustainability and sourcing wild meat is is really doing us deer stalkers a huge service because it's encouraging these people to come out and see that as the primary objective of what they're doing no absolutely the only bit that that still bugs <clears throat> me is though is that we have lots of interesting people coming out to do it however we've still got game dealers that will give minimal minimal payments for for deer and then anything they do get they're just shipping it out of this country it's not it doesn't get to the to the uk food chain I think your experience and I think the experience of a lot of stalking outfits is quite different to ours there, actually, interestingly. Um, and I have found this because we will, I would say probably, and this may be down to the fact that the majority of our species tend to be the smaller species, unlike you, mm. majority, I'd say probably 80% of our clients that come stalking with us will take away their own shot venison. So I don't actually have to engage with the uh, game handling establishments. I'm sure they're wonderful people, but uh, the, the, the times that I actually have to step through the front door of a uh, um, AGHE is once in a blue moon. And, no, and that's, that's good. So effectively it goes straight from the field to the consumer. Um, and it is then, it is locally sourced and consumed by the person that has shot, shot the animal. And I think that that really completes the circle for us because you get very often you'll get a beginner or someone who wants to get out shooting. And within, you know, within a few weeks, they, they, they've they learned what to do. They've gone out with a guide. They've shot an animal and they're serving it up to their wives and families and friends at home. And, and, and for me, that's a massive thrill. And I know it's an enormous thrill for them as well, because goodness knows how many photos I get of, uh, <laughs> of dinner plates of, uh, of the venison being served up. So no, that's uh, fantastic. Yeah. As I say, it's, it's easy enough with a smaller deer species, but yeah, a big red, nobody really wants to try and fill the back of their, their small car with what, well, even a pickup, it fills the back of a pickup, just one red deer. Well, I think, and then you've got the problem of when you get it home, haven't you? Because, uh, uh, you know, a lot of uh, the clients that we deal with, if they've got a garden, I'll be surprised because, you know, you've, you've got people who live in flats in the towns and cities and they need a kitchen that's big enough to be able to to break down a carcass. And you're certainly not going to be able to do that with the red, as you point yeah. out. Absolutely. It reminds me, we were visiting family down in, in Surrey and uh, I, I got invited out for a fallow stalk. So coming back that night, when was it? It was around about uh, was it August time. It was boiling hot. There's a fallow carcass in the back of my motor on a fairly busy residential area in, in Surrey, just outside Red Hill. And uh, and there's me butchering yeah. it down the side of the house. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, uh, yeah, it takes people a bit by surprise when they see it, doesn't it? Absolutely. But it had to be done. I couldn't hang it for my usual amount of time, but it was uh, it was all broken down. And uh, yeah. yeah, it's it, it is one of those things. But yeah, everybody had everybody had a load of venison out of it. Well, and I think, you know, as you get more, more mature in the sport, you you do question yourself. Am I going to squeeze the trigger here or, you know, because you realize the, uh, the enormity of the task of uh, 
of, of getting the carcass back and then breaking it down at home sometimes. So I, I think that that's a real consideration for people. But we 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 certainly try to you know as a as a club and as a provider of, of deer stalking outings, we we're always trying to find ways of ensuring that it that that venison gets straight back to the end consumer because as I say, that's that's really increasingly for our clients what the whole thing is about. No, absolutely. And it, it seems to be a growing market. There's a lot more people actually more concerned about where their meat come from, be it be it venison, be it game birds and things like that. And, and it's great to see. It's just obviously we just need to get the momentum growing, I think, a bit more and get it on more people's plates at the end of the day. And, and, and you know what, actually, when, when you actually talk to people about it, uh, it's an easy conversion, isn't it? If you can get your foot in the door and actually have a conversation with a, another meat eater or, or even a, a vegetarian very often, when you actually are able to tell them that what you're about is sourcing wild, sustainable, free range, non-intensively farmed meat. Well, <laughs> I mean, anyone that eats meat, first of all, it can certainly not take the high moral ground when it comes to hunting. We've got we firmly claim the high moral ground there. And, uh, Absolutely. And, and I think, you know, once you explain that to people, they, they're quick to come on board. No, no. Yes. And it, that seems to be the way. So obviously the, the Capriolas Club, it um, it covers organising hunts, things like that. But was it I was looking on there and you, you organise butchery demonstrations and, and basically training people how to do things like that? Or does that come on to the, the shooting and hunting academy? Well, the, the Capriolas Club is really, so perhaps I can help your listeners understand ha- how it works and, you know, a typical client. Yes. So the typical client might come to us and we do pick up an enormous amount of beginners um, or those perhaps coming who are living in the UK have been hunting abroad and want to make that transition to understanding what the requirements are of hunting in the UK. But almost invariably, we've got someone that comes to us initially who requires some type of of of, of training and uh, initially we used to or offer a bit of training in the field but increasingly we found that it was more fair to the individual and to the deer themselves that that person who was pulling the trigger was suitably empowered to understand what they were doing what species they're taking, where their shot placement should be, what the shot reaction would be, what the legislation was, et cetera. And that we found that the more we empowered people in the process, the more they enjoyed it and the better they were at it. Okay. So we, we started running um, a, a course called the Proficient Deer Stalker uh, Level 1, um, which gave a, a lot of the information uh, that they would require to be able to go out shooting. And after, I suppose, probably about five five to ten years, probably a decade of running that, a, a few years ago, we had that accredited um, by, and your listeners will be completely aware of Lantra. It's a off-quell regulated, probably the biggest land-based awarding body in the UK. Yeah. Um, and they accredited our proficient deer stalker level one. Um, so what we do now, uh, coming back to your question, is our typical candidate that comes to us tends to do that proficient deer stalker level one as a first point of call. Um, and as part of the practical, we'll go out and get some experience of, of, of shoot, checking that they can shoot straight and, and, and that they know what they're doing and dispatching a deer. And then having got that experience in the field um, of having passed a Lantra approved uh, course they are then welcome to join the capriolas club okay um, so that's that's kind of the transition that that they make and the capriolas club you're quite right it, it offers trips events we probably put on an event every few weeks so that might be everything from i don't know i mean i've got the road r- coming up soon so we'll get a group of rifles on that it might be seek a deer down in Dorset. It might be a trip up to the Highlands of Scotland for Reds. We'll take a lodge as a group of guys. Um, we're doing chamois in the in the high Alps. We've got driven boar on the continent. We've got trips to Norway for elk and capercaillie and you know and all of these things going on in a in a typical year. So we've got we've got all of that. And of, of course also we find that 
in terms of their licensing, because the, you know, rather than just coming out and using an estate rifle, invariably they'll want to get their own firearms license. Absolutely, yeah. And you know, having got that qualification, that Lantra approved qualification, well, that's you know that 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 shows that demonstrates competence as far as the police are concerned. So that's that's really that's important. Good. Um, and then they can make that transition into doing all the events and trips. But to, to assist them with that firearms application, we are able to, I suppose, give them the guidance. And the police do like to see that a lot of these guys who live in towns and cities or, or elsewhere, that they've got the, the police have got the confidence of understanding that the firearms applicant has got a, a good base, a club, a mentoring um and and somewhere where they can use that firearm absolutely so so your yeah your capriolas club is is similar to the idea of like the st hubert's um hunting club but it definitely sounds like it's uh it's more welcoming and uh and probably slightly easier to get into well i'm, I'm sure that st hubert's club are very lovely people and i'm sure they're very welcoming so i wouldn't <laughs> so i wouldn't i wouldn't dream of saying anything to the contrary but you I, I haven't got a lot of experience at St Hubert's. Um, I think a couple of our members actually have joined from there. So that that that's that's great. And uh, and I wish them well because these types of clubs are a wonderful um, platform from which people can explore and enhance their 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 access to to, to field sports. No, absolutely, so, absolutely. So the PDS one, let's 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 move on to that as you've mentioned it there. Obviously, most people that would have listened will be traditionally uh, knowledgeable of, of DSC-1 and DSC-2. How, where does the PDS-1 sit in that? And, and what, what, why was it? Well, you've obviously explained why it was created, but where do you think it's going to go to? Well, look, let, let, let's wait, make one thing absolutely clear, Peter. You know, the DSC-1, the DMQ route is an excellent qualification been running for a long time. I've got the highest admiration for it. Um, I've done it myself. I'm an approved witness for, for deer management qualifications. I've gone all that route. I, I've nothing but the greatest admiration for it. So I would like to point that out straight away. But we owe it, I think, to the consumer and, and to people wanting to get into deer stalking to be able to offer them options. It's always in the interests of the consumer that one individual or one party does not have a monopoly on something. Um, so I think what we have done there with that proficient deer stalker with the Lantra course is we've simply offered people an alternative. And for a lot of people, that alternative is, is very attractive. And we're seeing it's very attractive because the theory element of the proficient deer stalker is achieved through the a shooting and hunting academy which you can get find online and that's an e-learning platform so rather than having to and this will be very relevant for people in scotland um, rather than having perhaps to travel many hours to a to a, an assessment center having to spend two hours in a uh, sorry a couple of nights in a in a bed and breakfast or something like that and all the related expense just to be able to look at a you know slides and and things that are shown on an overhead projector i mean, things may have moved on but that's certainly my experience yeah well, no, absolutely. you don't need to these days you do not need to travel to an assessment center to 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 be able to see this you can do this much more efficiently and effectively via an e-learning platform which incidentally as well gives brilliant continuity of delivery so okay. you can be sure that whether you do the PDS1 theory in, in Aberdeenshire or whether you do it in Kent, you are going to get the same delivery of content, aren't you? Yes. Um, yeah, yeah. And, and, and that's brilliant. And we can we find that you can imagine that a lot of our clients have been have led very busy working lives. They've got families, they've got child care commitments, they've got all the rest. They cannot pick up and go to an assessment centre for two or three days uh, to do a DSC-1. But they can spend a few hours every evening during the week on the train on the way into work or after work at home, um, working their way methodically through a series of modules, classes and exams that give them the same result. OK, got, yeah, yeah. They've got, they've got a, a syllabus there, which is 
broadly equivalent to the DSC-1. We know what we need to be able to do to be, or we know what we need to know in, in order to become a deer stalker. So the content and the syllabus is there, and it is much the same in the proficient deer stalker as it is in the deer stalking certificate. Yeah, no, I, 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 yeah, I did look through. There seems to be, you do cover a bit more on firearms legislation and everything like that, which I don't think the DSC-1 kind of touches it may have changed slightly since i did it but it didn't seem to cover as much of yeah there's a few differences there's a little bit more practical instruction um showing people how it might be best to handle a firearm how it might be best to get a safe and um an, an accurate shot that that's all there we've also got um on the proficient deer stalker level one we've got a um food hygiene course now as well which you get as part of the pds1 so having completed the pds1 you're then offered to do a large game meat hygiene course um, okay which we and we're engaged with the food standards agency on that so that's a, a good legitimate recognized course and interestingly the dsc1 no longer provides that Whereas no that was that yeah it used to be part of it and then it's now been taken away i think hasn't it yeah was add, added to the, I think they've added it to the DSC-2. So, um, so you know, the PDS-1, I think for those reasons, so, I mean, just to finish off how that PDS-1 works. So you, having done the, the the theory element, having done your food hygiene course, I, I know your listeners will be screaming out, but you can't learn how to shoot a rifle online. And of course, what we've had there is we have a series of approved verifiers from everywhere from the north of Scotland to Devon and Cornwall to Kent um, and these approved verifiers are you you can access an approved verifier near you who you can go and visit and then they will sign off on the um, demonstration of safety and, uh, and, okay. and and proficiency in terms of your accuracy when it comes to shooting away. so that that's that's basically the shooting test that you had in your DSC one Exactly that. Yeah. And it, it, it requires, you know, a couple of different positions as it would with the DSC route. It requires um, that you handle the weapon safely and, you know, and, and so forth. So you can see that in terms of accessibility, um, the PDS-1 is, is, is fabulous. And, you know, if you are a person who perhaps is struggling to get to an assessment centre, is struggling to um, get out into the countryside, or, or simply struggling to find time, um, then it does facilitate that. And as again, you know, we've got a duty, haven't we, to to encourage people to the to to what we do, to deer stalking. We want to invite people to come in. So being able to offer um, people the a, a viable alternative to the DSC one is not. If the DSC one's right for you, it's right for you. Fabulous. You're going to end up with a good qualification, but all we are doing is offering a viable alternative to people in the form of a, of a Lancher accredited course where they can no, go out and, um, I, and, and learn pretty much the same thing. I agree. It, it sounds like it's um, it's certainly moving, especially that the part where you can do it, the e-learning. I think DSE one tried to bring that in during the COVID, but it's kind of that's disappeared again now. But to have an e-learning, especially when you talk about people who struggle with time and time is it's the only thing you can't create more of at the end of the day that and land um it's it's one of those things that people can actually do in their own time and get sorted out i remember doing my one of my bow hunting qualifications and that was a similar thing it was an e-learning you went through it as you needed to and you worked your way through the course and then you had to do exactly the same you had to go to an approved center to to demonstrate the practical side of things yeah yeah yeah. So obviously with the PDS one, is there a PDS two? Is is there? Well, the... do, you, do you know, Peter, uh, you you've walked straight into that one because <laughs> because it, would you believe it? Um, we launched it yesterday. So the there PDS go, two, like the PDS one, used to be run in the field. Yep. Um, but so we've been, you know, following the success of the the PDS one and seeing how. Um, well it has worked and been able to be delivered online um, we've now after many many months of kind of work we've we've finally launched the pds2 and that is available now on the shooting and hunting academy so so people who have done their pds1 can now move on to a higher level i suppose of of learning 
Um, and what we wanted to do, Peter, is, is, is make sure that this PDS2 really kind of represented the, the, the we'd like to say the, the, the gold standard of, of deer stalking qualifications, because what we have done is we have introduced to our level a further online learning okay. um, via the platform. So you can access further e-learning and, and advice on things like land assessment, risk assessment, deer management plans. We've got more on deer ecology, understanding aging deer in the field, aging post-mortem by teeth. We've got further uh, information on firearms and optics, like understanding parallax and all that type of thing. So it's, it's a really good comprehensive course that we're adding an enormous amount of value to PDS2 candidates. And what they do, having completed, I think it is 70 multiple choice questions and with a pass mark of 80%. So it's quite stringent. Mm, uh, what yep. they have done, what, once they have um, passed that theory element, um, they are then invited to download a logbook. And through that logbook, they then present that to an approved verifier in their area who then requires that they complete a series of performance criteria in the field, uh, which the approved verifier signs off and witnesses in the field. Um, and, it, and interestingly, we, we feel that it's important that the candidate should demonstrate their proficiency in the field on at least two occasions. Okay. So to, yep. so to uh, complete, so to, just to be clear, to complete that PDS2, you will have had to done an e-learning theory course, a further course, pass uh, multiple choice exams throughout the course that result with an 80% pass mark, and you will have had to have demonstrated your competence at, at dispatching, culling and extracting and uh, hygienically storing deer on at least two occasions to complete the qualification. That's really good because obviously there, yeah, there were some some major changes with the, the, the DMQ version. It used to be three stalks in the field, and then suddenly yeah. it was reduced to, oh yeah, you can do it all in one. Well, I've always thought you can kind of get lucky in one, but if you've if you've got at least you've got to have at least multiple chances because if 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 all the planets align and everything goes perfectly and you do it once, happy days. But as we all know, when you shoot enough deer, things go wrong and it's not always perfect. And if you manage to pull it off for that one qualification, you, you've ticked the box. But the next time you go out, it all goes wrong. You could get yourself in a whole not a mess at the end of the day. Oh, I, I, I think you're entirely right in truth. And I was surprised, you know, I, my DSC2 was uh, required a three, three cars. In fact, I think it took me 10 efforts to get it. So it's a, it ended up being a very expensive process. So I was always a little bit, I suppose I, I personally felt uh, three was perhaps too much, but one was too little. So in actual fact, that's why we have arrived at demonstrating it twice. Um, because I think, you know, that provides that that happy medium whereby, as you say, you know, you're not just going to go out once and get lucky. You've got to demonstrate it and repeat it on a second Absolutely. occasion. But requiring people to do it three times, we felt, well, you know, they've shown it twice now, you know, that 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 should be sufficient. So I hope we've reached a really good balance there with that PDS2. And I think, you know, as I say, DSC2, DSC1, very good. I want to be, you know, I don't want to be crit overly critical of that. But I think we have heard back a lot from our approved verifiers and professionals in the industry who felt that dropping it to one um, ICR, one independent colour record, was was perhaps um, a step further than they might have gone. Let's, I just wonder whether it was it was more to just to get get the numbers up at the end of the day, because it seemed as though that level two was one of those things that just people got it, but not many people did it because of obviously oh. the numbers required and whether or not it was a, a movement just to try and it get things up but i do know accredited witnesses that have been struggling and saying well failing people because at the end of the day they're like well you can't pass because it's mm -hmm. wrong and, and that's mm -hmm. the biggest problem well i think there has been quite a lot of pushback you're right from you know from the approved witnesses and um you know and uh, and, and and a, and a fair number in truth are are, are now Acting as proof verifiers for 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 the for the Lantra course for the for the PDS route, um, but you know I, I want to be very clear because it's all very easy to be critical of 
you know, of a, of a training provider and think we could do things better. And I, I, I want to be very clear that, you know, DMQ have done a terrific job over the years of ensuring that we've got good high standards of, of deer management in this country. You know, DMQ have been responsible for that for, you know, several decades now, haven't they? Mm, and, yeah. uh, you know, I, I would generally, I'd sort of, you know, take my hat off to them and say, you know, they, they've done a terrific job in, in, in the industry. And I don't, and it's very easy to, to, to criticise and think we could have done it better. But, you know, there is a whole wealth of uh, legislation. There's, there's information that is supplied uh, to, via DEFRA, via food standards agency and so you can imagine as a training provider we are we have an awful lot of information coming across our desks and we have to make some good decisions i think of what our course uh, involves based on a lot of information and whilst it, you know whilst we are very mindful and we do have an ear open to what people on the ground are saying we also have to be mindful of what the government departments and bigger agencies are, are also telling us. So I, I would say that, you know, DMQ have come to a position where they feel comfortable and, you know, and, and an awful lot of will, people will quite rightly support them in that. And I hope that a lot of people will also support us and understand that, you know, that, that, that proficient deer stalker level one has been um, instituted after an awful lot of input from people on the ground and from uh, other agencies as well. Yeah, how, how so just going, well, the, the, the million dollar question is, how is your uptake on the course? Are, are, are you getting good feedback from it? Are you getting kickback from the from the traditional DSC1 people? Where, where do you think you're standing at the moment in terms of going forward? Uh, uh, in truth, we're on a very fast upward trajectory. Okay. Um, I, I think it works very well for us because because we have county deer stalking, because we've got our YouTube channel, because we've got Capro's Club, we've got the Shooting and Hunting Gallery, we have a very big platform uh, from which we are, um, you know, gaining an awful lot of um, traction. So you can imagine, I mean, anyone that, you know, taps deer stalking into, into Google is going to find one of our platforms. And um, so we have a very um, wide audience. I think we reach, you know, uh, over a thousand people every day. Um, oh, okay, for, right. Yeah. yeah. So, so it's, a, it's a vast platform and you can imagine a good slice of those people are beginners. So the trajectory is very good. And and it has overall, you know, I think as, as with anything that is new, there are always the naysayers, there are always the, dare I say, use the word trolls, but, uh, you know, and there's always people who are going to poo-poo what you're doing because they like the status quo. But, you know, as an industry, you know, I, I think, you know, this PDS one, I think it's the future. E-learning is going to be the future, whether we like it or not. The age of sitting in classrooms doing courses, it's going to go. Yes, um, definitely. And, you know, and because we have proper external accreditation not just from Lantra but from UK rural skills as well you know we've gone to a huge amount of, of, of effort to jump through the hoops that are required to get that accredit accreditation and as I, I would reiterate that you know Lantra, Lantra themselves are off qual regulated you know this is a this is a big uh, a big step to take and because we've got all of that I think overall, when people do dig a little bit deeper and they actually look at the course and the content and, and, and what is delivered, um, you know, they, they're, they're nothing other than positive about it. And that, that comes across from, you know, the professionals, it comes across from numerous police forces and it comes across from the, the people taking the course as well. That's fantastic. Obviously, it, it, it gives a bit, bit of variety, I suppose. Somebody gets to choose which which method they go and which course they take at the end of the day. So well, that's really good. And at least it's growing and people are, are getting fully aware of it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and you know, uh, as I say, I wouldn't for one moment say don't do the DSC. No, I mean, do the DSC is fabulous. It's great. You might also want to consider the PDS route. So it's, uh, you, you know, it's, uh, I, as I've said numerous times throughout this podcast, you know, I, I don't want for one second to people think that I am trying to get rid of DMQ or trying to 
poo poo it. It's brilliant. They've done a great job for many, many years. And I hope that they will continue as a alternative viable option to the proficient deer stalker. No, absolutely. And and that seems to be, well, I think people with choice now, everybody uses the internet. It's one of those things. Again, you just, you mentioned, you touched on the word that the trolls or the keyboard warriors, every man and his dog that sits on the internet will uh, will tell you that we're, we're all doing it wrong. And the ones of us that get out there and shoot, we just kind of smile and just, you just have to carry on, don't you, at the end of the day? I, I, it, it does make me laugh sometimes, Peter, I must say, you know, I think probably because we do have quite a big exposure you know we're, we're getting so many people well invariably there's going to be a, a minority who, who who want to say something negative and uh, i i i it, it probably makes me chuckle more than anything else really and uh, i think that's the world we, we live in the heart can we we're always going to get it when you whenever you, whenever someone puts themselves out there they're always going to get that little that, that side of things aren't they unfortunately yes yeah. so obviously that's where you are now with the the three parts of the 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 business at the end of the day plans for the future anything exciting coming up or any any new ideas that you, you want to share world domination peter world domination that's what it's always about isn't it? <laughs> is that yeah obviously yeah. you were you had a stand at the stalking show and um how did you find that was was it was it popular was it busy were you getting lots of inquiries there do you know we were we were absolutely delighted to be there and it, it was brilliant we didn't do it in the first year um, but what was brilliant was the ability to go along and actually kind of shake hands with people and, and meet people who are perhaps engaging with us online, meet them face to face. And we found, uh, you know, in contrast to the talk of trolls and, and that type of thing, we found everyone was unbelievably friendly. The, the whole stalking show was an absolute credit to um you know, to, a credit to the industry because it was a very friendly atmosphere, and uh, I thought it was it, it was brilliant. And and a few years ago, you would have never got that many people under one roof. You'd have never got, um, uh, you know, you'd never been able to fill a venue of that size. Mm. And I think that that is, you know, that that's testament to the fact that we're in in an industry that is that is growing and developing. Well, they do say, don't, I think though, there was reports out that uh, deer stalking has become one of the most it's sort of popular shooting sports that suddenly has, mm. has taken taken over in the last few years. And it just seems to be growing and growing. Well, well, thankfully, I mean, that goes hand in hand with the highest deer population in a thousand years, doesn't it? Yeah. Well, you know, as I, uh, I wrote an article about this recently because it, I had this, um, you know, this slight concern, of course, that there is a, a a pendulum effect of a high deer population invites lots of deer stalkers invites lots of attention lots of deer start getting shot and the pendulum rapidly swings back the other way to a point whereby you've got an excess of deer stalkers and a and a and, a, and not enough deer yes um, and i think that that can sw- unless it is carefully and sustainably uh, dealt with and managed and people's expectations of what they can harvest from the natural environment uh, are are moderated um i think you know then potentially we could reach a problem so you know i mean that that's we're talking about many years in the into the future i think and 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 the reforestation of much of the uk and 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 defra's um you know plans to increase more you know add more trees to the environment etc cetera, etc cetera. go go kind of um uh, would tend to, to support a high deer population so th- there's some there's some challenging variables there i think in the whole mix which are going to be interesting yeah i think we have to watch out for though because obviously we get a high deer population because you get a lot of guys that their their whole business is based around it's a crude way of putting it, but it is trophy hunting. It's taking taking something with a piece of wood on its head at the end of the day, mm-hmm. and and they're not out to to do deer. They they kind of do deer management, but they don't want to go out and shoot lots of does and and female species deer because there's no reason to shoot that, and it doesn't bring in a high price. So their their main game is 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 sales and revenue, and of course that helps a deer population boom suddenly. Well, well, they've got a flawed they've got a flawed business model, haven't they? I would yeah. say those people that are, you know, if, if that as a deer manager or as a deer stalker, that is your model for revenue creation, then it's flawed and it's unsustainable. Um, I, it's not our model in the least. And I think 
that people commonly make the mistake with the Capriolas Club because it tends to be a fairly high-end service. The, you know, the demographic tends to be a relatively, um, and good luck to them, a relatively sort of wealthy um, client base. The assumption is that these guys are only interested in, you know, in the trophy animals. And, and that is, couldn't be further from the truth. It, it, you know, our guys are sensible, educated guys that are fundamentally interested in, in harvesting non-intensively wild meat from the environment and the joy of being in the field, in the countryside and enjoying the actual hunt. And that is absolutely what they're all about. So it's, that, uh, that, that's a refreshing, a breath of fresh air, because unfortunately you hear far too well, the press get hold of things. And it is it's always about the trophy hunter that comes over that wants to shoot the work, the middle class type of animal at the end of the day. Yeah. And, and, and I think that's that's where we have to work hard to actually try and get it across that harvesting a harvesting an animal is is not just about you might get a souvenir out of it, but it's actually about putting food on the table. Well, that, that's right. And, um, you know, this this trophy word is killing us, isn't it? And mm. uh, and I think, you know, in truth, you know, people who do take a, a, a large animal, I'm not saying that our clients never shoot one. There is a place to shoot, them, but they are the minority. And, you know, it's more a question, I would say, of, of perhaps taking an individual who's gone out and who might have shot, you know, a dozen animals. And then, you know, and they've all been sort of suitable cull animals that fit the plan and then you know one day he goes and goes i tell you what i got one this big this time you know i actually got a big one and he puts it on the wall and it's pride of place but you know that is no different to the fisherman who goes out and catches 100 fish and one day goes i got one this big today you know exactly it's occasionally it, it's... he takes a very big fish i mean it, I, i'm not a fisherman so perhaps that's a, a poor analogy but uh I think, you know, there's a place to take a big head every now and then, but you've got to recognise that it, it, it's it got to be uh, an every now and then event rather than. Yeah, that. no, absolutely. Stalking. And I think, well, we the, the obviously the big buzzwords at the moment is Scottish government have a thing about rewilding everything, but they don't tell the general population that when she rewilded something up here, that's it. All the deer are gone. It normally gets fenced and, and shot. Nobody hears about that. Um, and, and it's one of those things that, yeah, um, how does we have to work so carefully because you, you mentioned some anything like that and, and the press will turn it around, spin it on their head and, and put it out there that we're the bad guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a, there's a, a very poor lack of information in this country. And I, I'm starting to think we are more and more unique. The UK is more and more unique in terms of its press uh, mm. in, and their the narrative and the agenda um, of, of what they are trying to achieve is so misguided. Uh, it, interestingly, you might note on the wall, Peter, I, I, this, your listeners won't be able to see this, but if you look down to the far right, I have a, I I have a, it, a, yeah. a, a framed copy of the Daily Star Sunday, of which I featured myself on uh, Guncock is Sick Trophy Hunter, I, th I think is the, <laughs> is, the, is the very impartial sort of headline. But, you know, so I have been a victim of that sort of media. So was, um, that, was, that, a, was that an Africa trip or something like that that, that, that got you in the press? No, I, I, I don't know what they sort of got on a whole load of stuff on there. It was absolutely ill-informed uh journalism and you know very misguided and and, and uneducated and uh, you know uninformed and and it's um it, but nonetheless that seems to be the narrative they seem to be immune to um the fact that probably what they're doing is doing a disservice to wildlife by peddling this narrative because they're probably sort of damaging the self-serve self-same animals that they're trying to sort of you know pretend to be trying to protect because they have such a poor understanding of it. And of course, really the media needs, it needs proper informed debate. And yeah. whilst you get that in other countries uh, around the world, in the, con the continent, in the States, in Scandinavia, Germany, these sort of places, the press seem ill inclined to do it here in the UK. And it's a great shame. It does seem to be that way. And and there's no, there, 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 there seems to be no halfway house. They don't want to hear about it. They don't want to, 
produce anything. It's almost as if everybody has been uh, as Disneyfied. The Disney effect has has taken over, and uh, and we're all the big great white hunters kind of thing that uh, are causing all the problems. But I do think you know to to sort of finish that on a on a slightly more positive note. I do think that the tide might be changing slightly because as I say, I have noticed demonstrably over the last few years, the change in the type of client that is coming to us and the awareness of perhaps the um, the unsustainability of intensively farmed animal agriculture yeah. um, and the need for, you know, for biodiversity reasons to, to stay on top of a, of a ballooning deer population. So I do think that you know what, what is it there's that wonderful phrase isn't it the arc of the arc of the moral universe bends slowly in favor of justice i i, I probably absolutely <laughs> <laughs> i probably absolutely ruined that i think it's a, a is it a um Lisa king quote i forgive me i should I, it's going to be one of those things i wish i never, never got we'll, into, we'll but, find it and put it in the comments that's it yeah so, that's uh, right yeah. yeah it is i'm i think it's uh uh I, I've probably absolutely ruined that that quote. Um, but nonetheless, I think the point is I'm trying to make is that time, if you are doing something right, and if you have got the correct justification for doing it, and 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 what you are doing is sustainable and and in the interests of the environment, the message must get through eventually, mustn't it? I it hope must so. get yeah. through eventually. I would I would I would really hope so it's um it's just a long slow process and I think we have to keep plugging away at it but unfortunately it will it probably defeats a lot of people along the way because it is such a it's such a muddy field you're plowing through and, and forever getting stuck in and that's that's it, the biggest it, problem it is Peter but I think we've got one enormous thing in our favor and and that is the rise of social media the rise yes. of podcasts like yourself, the the rise of YouTube, uh, Facebook, Instagram, and, and and I think this gives us the opportunity, and like you're doing here today, gives us the opportunity to get our voice out there, and and that is something that we didn't have years ago, you know, and so that there's a real positive there. So if if good people like you, Peter, you know, if, if people like yourself, quite genuinely, I mean this, if people like yourself and people like, you know, Field Sports Channel and, uh, you know, dare I say, you know, our YouTube channel and, you know, our websites and, and countless other people who are putting themselves out there, if we continue to get this message of sustainability and uh, 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 if we get that message out there, then I think social media is our friend. Yeah, I think I think it, it does have its positive places. We we d obviously we've noticed things in the algorithms on on Instagram and Facebook that they are starting to they they don't like certain things appearing in in their programs and stuff like that, and they are filtering a lot more out. But as you say, if we can keep building and building slowly and steadily, podcasts, YouTube, everything works. Well, well, you're you're absolutely right, but there is a incentive then. I think because we've got to work with this to change our terminology, isn't that? Um, yes. I, you know, too used to the fact. Uh, you know, we, we're probably a bit too used to going out there and saying, "Yeah, I went out and I shot this animal." And well, the simple rephrasing of that, saying, "I went out into the countryside and harvest, uh, harvested an animal um, that I was going to then take home and and and, and use instead of buying a joint of beef from Tesco's." Um, just by changing that terminology from killing to harvesting, using sustainability, using biodiversity, using these phrases, we can, I think, ensure that, you know, we continue to get the right message out there. So if we have to adjust our terminology, well, it's a small price to pay in order to get that message, or message out there. I, I completely agree. And it, it, it it's key. It really is just to, to make sure and just as we keep doing, just keep educating and hopefully getting information to people and, and, and taking it from there. Mm -hmm. Well, I think I think that kind of um, you've explained everything that uh, was sort of my questions to you. So I think that's kind of a, a nice place to, uh, to to sort of wrap this podcast up unless there's anything else you, you have to add. 
No, Peter, I, I, it's been an absolute pleasure to speak with you. It's, uh, you know, thanks ever so much for having us on. It, it, it's been brilliant. It's nice to have that opportunity to tell your listeners about what we're doing. I, I expect you've probably got a few busy months ahead of you, though, haven't you? Uh, yeah, we've. I've just actually managed to, uh, well, I've been invited to help with a, a friend on the Reds this year. So uh, he's taken on a new estate. So we've, we're covering his overlaps there. So we'll be dragging a few, a few stags off the hill. Um, and uh, I think we're doing the opening season with him for Walked Up Grouse as well. So that'll be quite good fun. Uh, good, good. So well, again, listen, that that's that's something good to uh, to to get across to people how uh, how grouse shooting is is accessible to everybody. Yeah, and a, a subject of another podcast, I'm sure. Not not it me. Pretty I'm much, it, is, it will be. <laughs> Absolutely. But uh, well, thank you ever so much for this, and uh, yeah, it's been been a pleasure. Absolute pleasure, Peter. Nice to speak with you. I hope you enjoyed that podcast. It's certainly fun to record it and to find out a little bit more information about the new PDS-1 and PDS-2. It's always something to uh, to keep up to date with uh, with new developments within the deer stalking world. If you're looking for more information, obviously, if you Google PDS-1, it throws up their, uh, their website fairly quickly. If you've got any questions you want to ask me, message them over, email them across, and uh, we'll try and answer them. Anyway, check back in a couple of weeks' time because we have managed to get an interview with Rob Gearing of Spartan Precision. And it's a bit of a all-over-the-place interview, but uh, yeah, certainly some good information comes out of that. But uh, yeah, it's good fun.